So today, um, I'm going to talk about cultural macroevolution. So what is uh, cultural uh, macroevolution? Well, um, evolutionary scientists uh, like to distinguish between uh, microevolution and macroevolution. This is done in biological evolution, and it has become uh, to be more common to do in cultural evolution. So cultural microevolution can be defined as the change in the frequency of cultural variants within a population. So this is the definition from Cavalli, Schwartz, and Feldman, one of the foundational books, and I think it still serves quite well. But uh, cultural macroevolution focuses on large scale changes in cultural traits of whole groups. So as far as I know, this was the first proposed by Niles Eldridge, who is of course a biological evolutionist and Alex Missouri, um, our, our own Alex Missouri has also um, uh, proposed this definition. So I will be focusing on large scale change, changes in cultural traits of whole groups. Uh, one word about the connection between micro and macro evolution. In uh, biological evolution, uh, group level traits reduce directly to individual traits. So that seems to be pretty much uh, the dogma today. But in cultural uh, macro evolution, that's not quite right because some group, uh, uh, some group level traits do reduce directly to individual traits, but others are emergent properties of whole groups and are not reducible to individuals. So uh, for an example, think about institutions. It doesn't make sense to say that I have an institution. Only the, the society to which I belong can have an institution. Of course, institutions are, require certain individual traits. So for example, it would be nice if I have internalized certain so social norms that would support institutions. But nevertheless, uh, such uh, cultural characteristics as institutions are emergent uh, properties. And governance is um, one kind of institution that I will be focusing quite a lot throughout this lecture. So let's um, uh, think back about the evolutionary history of our species. Uh, we probably originated, roughly speaking, 200,000 years ago. And for more than 90% of our evolutionary history, we lived in small scale societies of foragers um, who were, um, these this societies were um, uh, uh, integrated by face to face uh, interactions. And then Holocene happened, roughly speaking, 10,000 years ago or so. Our human um, societies have gone a, uh, an amazing transformation. I call it the Great Holocene transformation. And this slide illustrates the scale of it. First of all, the social scale, the scale at which people have been uh, constructing societies and, uh, and um, the scale at which people have been cooperating has expanded by six or seven orders of magnitude. This is an amazing uh, change. But also the governance institutions have changed from farming villages uh, where uh, people, uh, most uh, people lived, uh, well, most agricultural people, let's say, lived uh, 10,000 uh, years ago. First um, arose centralized societies and then later states. So this all happened extremely rapidly. And um, this is not just an observation, it's not just an empirical observation, it also is a puzzle. It's an evolutionary puzzle. So what were the evolutionary mechanisms that we can use to explain the great uh, Holocene transformation? Well, um, we can, um, again, because my background is in uh, biology, it, um, I, I uh, try to fit what we do in cultural evolution with more general evolutionary uh, science. So um, uh, Sat Murray and, uh, well, uh, uh, Let's see, um, uh, I'm blanking out on uh, Maynard Smith and Sat Murray um, have uh, proposed a, a very uh, useful conceptual way of thinking about uh, macro evolution. They call it major evolutionary transitions. So examples of major evolutionary transitions, which are quite well known to uh, pretty much um, all biological uh, scientists are eukaryotic cell, multicellular organisms, 
use social insect colonies. And we can think of complex, large scale complex human societies as uh, another major evolutionary transition. I think that's a very useful conceptual approach to thinking about this uh, major puzzle that I have introduced in the previous slide. And um, Mendel Smith and Satmari have, um, uh, and uh, others who have followed in their footsteps, they have uh, proposed a general evolutionary mechanism. It's a very abstract, actually. It's so abstract that it fits both eukaryotic cell and also, I would say, I would argue, complex human societies. And these general processes involve, first of all, uh, we are talking about the transition from, let's call them particles, to collectives. So the very first um, uh, general process is that we need to accomplish uh, a major evolutionary transition is that particles have to evolve cooperation. As they put together collectives of particles, uh, we need now selection to operate on the next level, not just at, just at the level of particles, but we also need selection on collectives. Collectives have to compete against each other and some win in this competition. And this selection at the collective level is the one that gradually uh, suppresses particle selfishness and competition within collectives. So co competition between collectives starts to suppress competition within collectives. This, this is a very important uh, point. And that in the end leads to increased functional integration of collectives and eventually collectives become organisms, quote unquote. They are so well functionally uh, integrated that we can think of them as uh, organisms and then they can become particles for the next, uh, you know, uh, uh, spiraling um, uh, step in this uh, grand scheme of things. So um, uh, how does this help us to think about the uh, evolution of our own species? Well, um, competition between uh, collectives uh, can occur both at the genetic level and, and the, at the cultural level. I will, in my talk, focus entirely on the cultural side of things. And um, uh, although that doesn't, uh, I'm not trying to, to deny that there, there has been quite dramatic genetic um, um, uh, change, but, uh, and here, of course, uh, it is uh, the most useful conceptual approach is the one uh, by Pete Richardson and uh, Rob Boyd, uh, with their dual inheritance uh, theory. So uh, much of the mm, action in the last, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand years for our species has been first of all, uh, genetic um, evolution, then cultural evolution and, and, and very specifically gene culture co-evolution. So I won't be touching that side at all. I just want to acknowledge that that's an extremely important question. So my um, focus will be on the last 10,000 years when cultural multi-level selection has become a preeminent evolutionary uh, force. So, um, so the thinking about major evolutionary transitions suggests that if we want to understand the Great Holocene uh, transformation, we might want to evoke a cultural multi-level selection. So my good friend and colleague, uh, David Sloan Wilson, have made this argument uh, very clearly. He says that to understand the evolution of collective level cultural traits, we need to study selection on collectives. In other words, we need to look at the competition between uh, collectives and how that weeds uh, uh, collectives with some characteristics out and uh, allows others to survive. All right, now during the Holocene, uh, I would posit that the primary mode of competition between human collectives was warfare. And now I will stop calling them collectives, I'll start calling them polities. So a polity uh, is defined simply as a politically independent group of people and polities range in scale from independent agricultural villages or for that matter foraging bands all the way through um, chiefdoms, uh, states, empires and modern uh, nation states. So all of those are polities and now uh, I'm abandoning both collectives and societies as too vague. So I'll be talking about um, uh, the uh, human groups that I'll be talking about are polities. 
So warfare, I posit, uh, was the primary mode of competition between human collectives. And that this means that in order to understand the rise of large scale complex societies, we really need to study warfare, All right? What's interesting is that um, social, uh, historical social scientists have been working, but from a different direction to very similar set of ideas. So here I am uh, quoting a, a social, a historical sociologist, uh, Charles Tilly, who famously said, war made the state and the state made war. So this is a very interesting co-evolutionary idea which is implicit in this, um, in this saying. So specifically, a bunch of uh, historians and uh, historical sociologists have proposed, uh, they've been studying the rise of European states. And they have proposed that the, uh, the core reason for this um, observed uh, transformation was the so-called military revolution of the 16th uh, century, which involved the appearance of new gunpowder weapons and also I would say ocean uh, going ships. So this ap appearance of new uh, weapons have intensified warfare and increased interstate selection pressures. And that led to rapid cultural macro evolution along many, many different dimensions. So there were rapid increases in military technologies and also social technologies, uh, military organization and drilling. There was a dramatic increase in social scale because uh, large armies uh, win over small armies and large armies require large states. And these new larger states uh, needed new fiscal institutions to support themselves and uh, end warfare. So this is in a nutshell, the argument that comes from historical sociology about the role of the military revolution of the 16th century. And the thinking there is implicitly and sometimes explicitly evolutionary. So for example, one of these uh, uh, authors have uh, uh, compared this evolution to punctuated um, equilibrium. So um, I would argue uh, as uh, many have done uh, that evolutionary theory can provide us a really, um, a really a, a great integrative uh, framework that allows us to look at uh, a bunch of theories, not only coming from evolutionary scientists, but also from historians, archeologists, sociologists, economists, and many other social scientists. In fact, evolutionary thinking has been making great strides in penetrating social science um, in the last uh, couple of decades. So we see the rise of uh, disciplines such as evolutionary anthropology, evolutionary economics, and so on and so forth. But one point to make is that uh, the uh, military revolution of the 16th, 16th century was not the only one and not the first one and probably not the last one either. Uh, there were other military revolutions. The cavalry revolution, which, uh, which uh, uh, resulted from the invention of horse riding about 3000 years ago in the steppes of Kazakhstan and Russia. It uh, completely changed the logistics and supply, introduced new strategies. It caused the development of new weapons, armor, tactics, fortifications. So in many ways, it had a very similar effect um, as the military revolution of the 16th century. And it also has intensified warfare. We have several proxies that show that it resulted in very, it has uh, increased the existential threat to the states when cavalry uh, warfare spreads to them. The military revolution of the Iron Age. Iron uh, metallurgy has uh, introduced new weapons, new um, armor, and it also had lots of huge percolations into many other aspects of the society. So we, in the Seshat project, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, we have collected data on the spread of cavalry warfare. And so you can see it here. So it originated somewhere in this uh, Pontic Caspian steppe, very rapidly spread to the uh, east and west, more gradually to uh, south. And then of course, it, uh, we don't show it, but it has moved to the new world later on. Iron uh, spread, which we have also 
recently quantified was actually in many ways uh, similar. Uh, so there were two hot spots, one in North India, one in the Caucasus, and then that also spread east and west and south. In fact, those two um, uh, uh, cavalry and iron have tended to be um, to arrive at similar times in different parts of the world. So as you will see later, I will actually be combining these two uh, revolutions into one. But the question that we can ask then, so what was the effect of this uh, military uh, revolution? Let's call it Iron Cavalry. So what was the effect of this uh, military revolution on the evolution of the state and large scale societies? Well, this, this is the question that we have addressed together with Sergei Gavrilets, uh, Tom Curry, and um, um, Edward Turner in the PNAS paper, where we actually uh, uh, proposed a model that uses this observation, this military revolution, to uh, not only to model how the uh, large scale societies arise, but also uh, compare that to the data test the model empirically. And by the way, I want to mention that since then, my colleague Jim Bennett has, uh, has developed this approach uh, in uh, several ways. So this is actually has becoming, it's not just one model, it's now becoming a, uh, a modeling framework uh, to address a variety of questions. Since this paper is published, oh, let me just hit the highlights. So uh, it is an explicitly model of cultural multi-level selection. Uh, the historical period that we cover is uh, 1500 uh, BCE to 1500 CE, so about 3000 years of human history. Think about it as the ancient and medieval uh, uh, period. And notice we stop at 1500 CE, that's because at that point, a different military revolution has become salient. The special domain is Afro-Eurasia. We uh, um, use the cellular automata type of model where we divide uh, space into uh, cells and then we trace how regional communities start to uh, fight wars, uh, conquer each other or not, and uh, go under, or expand. And so the question that we are asking is what was, the, how did the evolution from mid-range to large scale societies, macro states and empires occurred? The core of the model is uh, quite simple. It starts with the spread of military technologies and we focus specifically on the spread of cavalry warfare. That in turn leads to intensification of warfare and puts um, a huge selection pressure on the states competing with each other. That in terms leads to the evolution of outer social institutions. These are the characteristics, the macro uh, evolutionary characteristics of polities that make them uh, more successful in this intensified uh, competition. And that in turn, lead, in turn leads to rise of large scale societies uh, because uh, larger societies have a greater chance of surviving in this uh, military competition. And of course they need outer social institutions in order to be able to function without collapsing. All right, so jumping through all the details our model actually did an, an amazingly uh, great job uh, predicting the actual spread of large scale societies. So on the left hand side, you see the data. This is the data for each of the three millennia, which um, and the red color in, indicates the um, high frequency of large scale societies and green color indicates uh, no, no such great uh, large scale societies arising in those regions and yellow is an in-between. And on the right-hand side, you see the simulated data. And of course, the simulated data does not um, reproduce all the aspects of um, the uh, real data, but uh, we do capture a remarkable nearly two-thirds uh, two -thirds of uh, variance in the data. So, so far so good. Um, the model um, does seem to capture something important. The model based on cultural motor level selection and capitalizing on this particular uh, military revolution does seem to capture something important about the actual historical uh, process. But there are many other theories. There are functionist uh, theories of the states, there are conflict theories of the state and our theory in fact belongs to 
uh, one subdivision on, of uh, conflict theories. I won't go through this list because it's just, I'm just scratching. I'm really scratching the uh, surface here. Uh, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, separate theories that people have produced over the ages, starting with Aristotle, Ibn Khaldun, and ending with the modern uh, historical social scientists. The big question is that, uh, yes, we have all those uh, great theories. So now how do we go about uh, slaying some of them off? That's the, uh, you know, that's the key part of science. And science, you don't just propose theories, um, which is, th that's a very important part of the job, but equally important, maybe even more important, is that we have to eliminate some theories in favor of others. So it's kind of an evolutionary uh, process. And of course, uh, the way we do it is by confronting, confronting, confronting uh, theories uh, with data. So how do we test these theories? Uh, Pete has already mentioned Seshat, a global history data bank. This is the project that uh, we started about 10 years ago. And the idea was to translate this huge corpus of knowledge from about past societies that archeologists and uh, historians uh, possess into the form that becomes usable for testing uh, theories. So the project goals have been to build a web of facts about past societies, critically, important is that we want them connected along spatial, temporal, and conceptual dimensions. Conceptual dimension is different types of variables that are proxies for different processes. So we are interested both in diversity and general patterns. And uh, the main goal so far that we have uh, used this uh, resource for is to empirically test and reject theories of social cultural evolution. So we've started on this process of cutting down the, uh, cor the theoretical corpus and trying to arrive at uh, some well-supported theories. So we want um, in the data set, we want both um, uh, space geography represented because we want to use this cross-cultural um, and uh, com comparative history approach. And so, um, these um, uh, markers indicate the areas where we sampled our societies. And you, as you can see, we started with 30, 10 markers, and now we have added five more. In fact, we are adding more, and eventually we hope to expand to cover the whole uh, space. So this is very important that we are trying to get, we are not trying to get just one particular region. Um, we, we want to get uh, a global um, uh, view at, uh, at history. But equally important is the temporal component because after all, evolution is about uh, the change in time. And that means that uh, if you don't know how things have changed with time, how things have evolved, it becomes very difficult to test, uh, to test uh, causal theories uh, of evolution. Causality also, um, is uh, we, we can resolve causality better when we have temporal component because generally speaking, uh, causes tend to precede effects. So capitalizing on this uh, time difference allows us to uh, closer approach the mechanisms. Of course, uh, time is not um, the, uh, the, so, the uh, solution for all kinds of problems. There are many uh, difficulties to overcome in this process. But uh, by not using the temporal um, uh, dimension, we really handicap our ability to test theories. So what we do, we go to each of these um, uh, the points on the map. So, so this one is the, in the upper Egypt. Then we drill back in time to the Neolithic because remember our um, uh, focus is on the agrarian period. Let's remember, I should say that our focus is on the agrarian period of, um, of human um, uh, societies. So we focus on the period between the Neolithic revolution, whenever that happened, to industrial revolution. So in this particular case, we go to Badarian period, which is the first Neolithic period in Upper Egypt. And then we go through uh, through the time of the, and arrive eventually at the Ottoman Empire where we, uh, where we end. And each of these uh, uh, segments 
is a particular polity, like this new kingdom uh, during the Thutmose uh, period was a uh, polity organized as an empire, actually multi-ethnic empire. Uh, some of the polities, as you go back, like Badarian, there were small scale uh, polities. Uh, no, uh, you know, Nakada period is when we see the first centralized societies arise and so on and so forth. So the actual unit for which we collect data is each of these polities, right? And this one, this graph shows the distribution of times that we have. Obviously, as we go back in time, first of all, uh, Neolithic revolution happened at different times in different regions. And secondly, of course, we have less data uh, to, uh, to trace the uh, really deep uh, evolution in time. Okay, so then we, what we do for each of these polities, we collect uh, a variety of data. And currently we have um, around uh, 500 uh, reasonably well-reserved uh, variables. And uh, the code book actually uh, contains 1,500 um, uh, such variables ready for, um, for uh, data collection. So since my focus is on the rise of the state, I will use one particular definition I like and also what uh, archaeologists prefer. They, um, for, they define state as uh, societies that have internally specialized uh, governments. In other words, bureaucracies. So how do we quantify this, um, this state, stateness? Obviously, it was not just, you cannot really say it is a state or not a state. There were all kinds of uh, transitionary phases in between. And so we do that by breaking the stateness into a variety. Here, uh, there are 11 uh, binary variables that we code uh, separately first, and then we combine them for the analysis. So these binary variables are other full-time professionals um, you know, in administration and in the military, uh, in uh, religion, other specialized government uh, buildings, what are the bureaucracy characteristics, uh, like, uh, for example, the examination system illustrated here. Um, is there a formal legal code, uh, like the Corpus Iuris uh, Civilis Romani? Uh, are there uh, specialized buildings for uh, legal system courts, professional judges, and so on and so forth? So governance then becomes the sum of binary variables scaled uh, from, uh, and then you scale it from zero to one by dividing, adding them all together and dividing by the maximum so that we have a scale going from zero to one. And because um, I don't have a lot of time, I won't talk about other uh, variables, but uh, let me remind you that we have uh, several hundred of them and I will be using them in analysis in a minute. So here's what um, the, the data looks like when you plot it. Notice I'm only plotting 10 world regions here because otherwise it would be just quite a uh, spaghetti uh, mess. So uh, we, we see here that uh, starting around uh, 5000 BC, uh, we don't see much governance. And then some regions are precocious, others are not. The important po point that I'm trying to make uh, with this graph is that, that um, uh, governance, uh, sophisticated uh, governance has arisen in different regions at different times, right? Secondly, it has, uh, its rate of evolution has been different. Sometimes like in this uh, Susiana region, we see a gradual increase. In other cases, we see quite rapid increase. There is also collapses of uh, governance. So what we see here, we see a very rich data set, a rich spatial temporal data set that, uh, that gives us a lot of variation to capitalize upon. And that's very important because in order to statistically test uh, theories, we need uh, uh, a as variable uh, data set as possible, All right? So this bodes well already um, uh, for the uh, success of the enterprise. Well, secondly, um, you, uh, there, you, you look at uh, that uh, graph before and you see a lot of spaghetti. But actually, there is uh, there are all kinds of uh, so there is a lot of diversity, but there are also some general uh, patterns. So here, what I do, I plot this governance uh, specialization. Remember, it's on the scale from zero to one against the uh, log transformed polity population, and we see actually that there is, of course, still quite a lot of um, um, uh, variation around this, but. Um, now, uh, suddenly, um, a, gener a general pattern starts to snap in, into focus. 
notice that uh, there are two blobs. So this red color indicates the density of points. So their tendency is for societies to be either in the left uh, lower uh, quadrant or in the right upper quadrant. And this transition is nonlinear. And we cross this 0 0.5 um, uh, boundary at um, roughly speaking 5.3 on this uh, scale. This corresponds to polities with uh, 200,000 uh, uh, subjects. So what this um, graph suggests that uh, in order to progress in social scale beyond a couple hundred thousand, and certainly beyond six, uh, which is million, uh, a million or more of, uh, of uh, subjects, citizens, uh, the states, uh, the polities have to become states. They have to acquire specialized uh, governance. But we also can ask, so what was this governance used for? Because that actually helps us uh, think about uh, this sort of functional, uh, functionalist approach, uh, uh, helps us to start thinking about the different theories that uh, various uh, researchers have proposed for the evolution of the states. So here in this uh, table, I show a variety of uh, functions. Well, it turns out that, and this probably comes as no surprise to historians or archeologists, that uh, the most important thing that pre-industrial politics have done was either fighting wars or uh, preparing for them, gathering um, resources for them, um, uh, building fortifications uh, and so on and so forth. So over 90% of politics in our Sashat sample, here is the N is the number of uh, politics for which we have um, uh, data. I excluded uh, unknowns. Um, uh, in this uh, tabulation. So over 90% uh, actually uh, made war, as uh, Charles Steele famously uh, mentioned. And then we go back. So there is quite some of the um, uh, uh, prosocial functions, like providing uh, food storage or water supply, is actually quite frequent also. Uh, infrastructure is uh, also quite frequent. And then um, the uh, informational connections, the, uh, the couriers, postal stations, and so on. And of course, as, you, as the sophistication of the services increases, the proportion of polities that uh, perform it declines. But what's more in, even more interesting is to let's plot uh, the proportion of polities that uh, perform this particular function against their social scale. So uh, again, the social scale is scaled to be locked, 10 locked, uh, locked 10 transformed uh, of population uh, of the polities. So five here corresponds to hundred thousand, uh, six is one million and so on and so forth. So what we see is that with warfare, it's very rapidly, but pretty much all large scale polities do that. Uh, if you um, um, uh, keep in mind that this is, there are a few polities in this range here. So uh, there is quite a lot of variance here, but uh, once you get beyond uh, uh, roughly speaking, 10,000 or 100,000, pretty much all the polities uh, have to either uh, defend themselves or they are, uh, uh, or they prey upon um, other societies. So um, with other things, so uh, they come more gradually. So here are the food storage and the water supply. Uh, the infrastructure tends to come uh, pretty much together with uh, canals, uh, trailing uh, roads and bridges. But again, once you get to this, uh, to uh, statehood, uh, most of them start providing these things. And of course, here is the postal stations and, uh, and postal services. So uh, this is a very uh, useful look uh, telling, uh, telling us um, how uh, the uh, variety of uh, uh, functions uh, performed by, uh, this, by the states has uh, changed as they have become uh, larger. And uh, one um, uh, thing is that uh, one uh, conclusion that we can reach from this one is that um, the pre-modern states have provided lots of services, but the, 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 the one which was nearly ubiquitous was uh, uh, warfare. All right, but that's uh, so far, we've been talking about correlation, right? And now it's time to use the time resolved um, nature of Sershat to test theories about uh, causality. So um, in the analysis, we want to use both the temporal component 
and the cross-cultural uh, uh, components of uh, data. And there are many complications, um, uh, which I have listed here. I won't go through them because um, uh, we can essentially deal with all of them in the analysis, right? To uh, a greater or lesser degree. And I'll return to this point at the end. And again, um, I won't go through the in, the, uh, in detail through this slide. Just basically, it's a dynamic regression model in which we regress the response variable here, y in location i at time t on its autoregressive terms. So this is the value of the same variable here in the same locality, but at time one century, two centuries uh, uh, before. Then we have uh, several terms to capture the complications, uh, such as the spatial diffusion, the uh, we, we use linguistic relatedness to try to get um, at uh, the shared ph phylogenies. Uh, and then here come the predictor variables, which I will be focusing on. And of course, there is the um, error term. So this has all been published, and um, you can delve into the details uh, if, you, uh, if you want them easily enough. So let's just uh, go right to the results. So we have, um, uh, I have used in the analysis uh, a variety, about uh, two dozen different uh, variables. And it turns out that the variables that turn out that are selected uh, as in the best model are depicted in this uh, table. Well, so first of all, GOV, GOV stands for the specialized governance. That's our, uh, dependent variable or response variable. And it, of course, uh, it, it, um, uh, has a, there is a memory effect, all right? So, uh, so this germ is the value of governance one century before. It turns out that uh, we only need AR1, autoregressive process of, uh, of order one, because the uh, other legs um, are not uh, important. But of course, this is the big effect, essential memory effect, as you could imagine in any kind of evolutionary process, you remember where you were before you can change. And so we see that. Interesting enough, it's a nonlinear effect. So there is some kind of a uh, stabilization thing because governance square is the negative term. It suggests that there is some kind of a uh, quasi equilibrium uh, value of governance. So if societies by chance get either above or below it, then try to approach it. So this is one interesting uh, uh, avenue for further research. All right. So phylogeny here, uh, which is also marked yellow because it's an autocorrelation term, also turns out to be similar. It seems that it, it looks like uh, societies which are, uh, which are uh, uh, connected by, um, have phylogenetic connections, that helps to explain the value of governance in them. And it makes sense. If you think about you know, France, uh, medieval France and medieval Spain, they have inherited a lot of institutions from the Roman Empire. And so we capture that because they're both romance speaking countries, all right? And so that provides us a proxy for detecting th such phylogenetic uh, effects. All right, the blue terms here are the scale. Population turns out to be quite important. Notice that these estimates are standardized estimates, right? So this means that we can compare the effect of uh, different factors by looking at the value here. And as you notice, uh, that population has a pretty large, um, pretty large uh, coefficient associated with it. Remarkably, territory is negative, all right? Uh, if you just correlate governance and territory size, you will see positive correlation. But in the analysis, which tries to get at causality, it turns out that territory is actually, a large territory actually breaks the development of governance. So it seems to be that uh, it is, if you are, need to govern dense populations, you need more governance institutions, but if you have a far spread population, then uh, actually you don't need quite as much governance uh, uh, to, uh, to keep the state together. This actually goes against one of the theories that uh, people have proposed uh, for the evolution of governance. So here we start seeing very interesting effects. Info stands for information systems. It has a substantial uh, effect um, and that's uh, understandable. It's not in order for governance uh, to be effective, you have to have bureaucrats and bureaucrats have to use uh, writing and records. And so that's captured in this particular 
uh, variable. The red ones are uh, new tech. This is the military technologies. I'll, sh I'll show uh, a bit more about it in, the, in a later slide. And uh, iron calf. So iron calf is the combined iron and cavalry. Basically, uh, we just added uh, together the presence of iron and cavalry. So you have a variable varying from zero when none is present, two when both present, and one is when one is present. Turns out this variable actually explains things better than either of them separately. So this is another big uh, effect. So quite comparable to the effect of population. Also, I should add that if you look at the, if you extend this approach and look at what factors affect the population, right, you will find the same iron cavalry and neotech also feed into population. So in a way, this um, um, proxies for intensity of warfare, they have uh, multiple uh, causal arrows uh, going through uh, the uh, variables. Okay, oops, sorry. Um, all right, um, agri, uh, which is the intensity of agriculture, the productivity of agriculture in tons of carbohydrate, uh, uh, in tons of grain per hectare, also has a substantial effect. So here we see uh, that what we are supporting, we are supporting the direct effects of scale, but in a very interesting twist here, uh, direct effects of um, uh, proxies for warfare intensity. And um, as um, many would have guessed, the, there is a substantial effect of, um, of um, productivity of agriculture. So um, here's a summary. I won't go through this in detail. I just want uh, to say that um, warfare intensity uh, pro uh, proxies, the mu tech is the variable which, um, which um, aggregates 46 binary variables uh, relating to different types of projectiles, uh, for such as simple bows, complex bows, um, uh, crossbows, different types of weapons, swords, uh, you know, uh, daggers, armor, defensive structures, the use of metals, um, you know, bronze, um, iron, steel, and the kinds of animals used in warfare. So this is a, a synthetic variable which tries to get the different aspects of, uh, of uh, military technology. All right. Um, so, uh, so social scale has an effect. Non-scale complexity uh, is ch channeled through information systems and, of course, resources. Now, equally important is uh, the theories that are not supported. So, first of all, I have already mentioned polity territory actually has a negative effect once uh, you uh, drill down to the causal uh, effects. That's very interesting, and that, of course, goes against the idea that states arose primarily to integrate large uh, flung uh, territories. Then a bunch of other things, provision of public goods. We saw that there is a strong correlation between the provision of public goods and the social scale and, uh, and also uh, governance. But it turns out that provision of public goods, first of all, it comes later in the evolutionary process. And it is really the effect of, um, of large scale and governance. So this governance, uh, once you get the governance which is whose primarily um, uh, function is to fight wars and keep the large state together, uh, they start providing public goods um, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Hierarchical levels has no effect and heritable status has no effect. These are some proxies that we can use to look at class-based uh, theories, not perfect and we need uh, better proxies to text Marxian uh, theories, but uh, uh, so far we see no effect. And um, people have proposed uh, uh, important uh, theories about how uh, religion might affect um, the rise of states. And it turns out that, uh, for example, moralizing supernatural punishment has no effect. All right, so as I said, um, it's not only important to find uh, uh, which theories are supported, but also which theories are rejected. Well, it is, uh, it's also equally important, as they say, on one hand, on second hand, on the third hand, um, we uh, also uh, want to identify theories that cannot be tested. So uh, we have talked, I have conjured my brain. How, do, how in hell do we test the uh, theory of kinship selection or reciprocal altruism? These are, of course, our theories that the critics of um, cultural multi-level selection, Richard Dawkins and Steve Pinker, have uh, uh, favored as the explanation. But, um, and, I, and I actually challenge other people, uh, in fact, please do come up with ways we could test those theories. So far we have found 
no such way. This means that these are actually really bad theories from the science point of view because they're untestable. All right, I'll, let's, let's reserve judgment because somebody smarter than me uh, may be able to come up with a testable way to, uh, to test these theories, but uh, uh, so far, this is where we are. So in contrast, although um, cultural multi-level selection continues to be controversial, so um, there was four years ago, uh, there was an article led by Pete Richardson and a bunch of other cultural evolutionists in BBS, uh, and uh, it was published with uh, extensive comments, so you can actually see what the controversy is about. So despite this controversy, so far what we see, specifically when we talk about uh, cultural macro evolution, uh, CMLS is a productive theoretical work that yields testable uh, predictions. All right, so to conclude, um, um, uh, cultural multi-level selection um, is, um, uh, is a real scientific theory because it generates testable predictions. And more than that, it actually, this, the predictions from the theory are borne out by uh, data and also by models. But um, one thing that the Seshat project has um, shown us is that historical data are quite um, good for us to test cultural evolutionary theories and reject uh, some theories in favor of others. And here, let me just say the temp time resolved uh, component is the key thing because without it, we would not be able to approach causality as well as we do now. And of course, the global sample is very important. So in a way, what we are doing is, is sort of like the paleontology of uh, cultural evolution. We cannot use uh, the experimental method, but we can use the historical analysis. Many challenges remain. I won't go through them, but uh, there is uh, all kinds of things that uh, we are still in the very early phase of this, um, of this endeavor. And um, uh, in the end, I want to thank, this, is, this uh, uh, data has been a result of collective efforts. It's, we, don't, we, don't, we don't only study cooperation, we practice it. And I, I want to acknowledge uh, the members of the CSAT team. And of course, I want to acknowledge uh, the various um, agencies and individuals who have uh, funded us. Thank you very much. Should I stop sharing or? So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Sergey, you need to. Uh, un, un... Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do, we do have a, a number of questions here. Yeah. And thank you very much. Uh, for your presentation, very informative and very nice. Um, well, should yeah. I stop sharing? Uh, as you wish. Yeah, it's my, up my, to you my, yeah maybe, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can go back and share if there will be a question. You can go back. Yeah, please do stop. Yeah, yeah okay. So we can see, we, we can see you better. Yeah. Okay, um, the first one. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your presentation. You suggest that the primary mode of competition was, war was warfare. I'm not so sure that other processes, such as disorganized occupation of territory for survival, uh, forced migration without fight, etc., played a major role. Warfare, of course, is uh, the one documented best. Uh, yeah. It's more so, like first of all, I would say um, that um, the role of uh, warfare has varied throughout um, our uh, um, evolutionary. Uh, history. So prior, during the Pleistocene, for example, um, most of the time humans lived uh, in very small groups and quite separated from each other. Like, you know, West uh, Europe, for example, had just a few hundred individuals in, uh, in late uh, Pleistocene. So it's um, unlikely that they fought uh, much because they actually uh, exchanged uh, you know, uh, genes and so on and so forth. Um, also, now in the last uh, couple, uh, since the uh, great, uh, since World War II, there has been all kinds of hopeful uh, developments, and I'm really hopeful that we will, um, you know, finally control warfare, warfare. All right, and so it's quite likely that warf uh, warfare is playing much less role. But during the period that uh, we are addressing the agrarian period. Um, as you saw, the data suggests that what politics did, they fought wars all the time. And remember, warfare is a nasty, uh, brutish uh, thing. 
what's important for cultural revolution is not that people get killed. What's important is that it's competition between societies, all right? And so this can happen without lethal um, uh, conflict. So for example, I grew up in the Soviet Union. It's a country which was never conquered by the United States, but it has acquired a bunch of institutions because it's essentially lost the, in competition uh, with the United States. So that's also multi-level uh, selection. Um, and uh, once we get to the historical period, uh, we are on very solid ground. Um, uh, that's what uh, politics did. They fought wars all the time. And final thought, um, in order for, um, you have to think about the, from the functionist point of view, what is the um, optimal size of a society? Well, uh, the scale of cooperation varies depending on what you are cooperating to do. So, for example, if you want just to grow grain or something, uh, then um, you need to cooperate maybe at the level of household or village, all right? But um, uh, if you want to defend yourself against uh, predators, human predators, then um, you want to cooperate on a large scale as possible. There is a runaway um, evolution here. Each, each uh, uh, animal polity becomes larger all right, so there is no actual, uh, there is no actual limit uh, for cooperation. And that's why uh, during the uh, uh, agrarian period, we see this um, uh, evolution of larger and larger states and empires. And by the way, since, the, since, competition, since military competition has become less important, we see uh, uh, quite the reverse. Uh, we see, uh, uh, especially in the peaceful uh, regions like Europe, for example, we see the breakdown of Czechoslovakia and so on and so forth. Okay, thanks. And um, uh, you were mostly talking about the last 10,000 years or so. And I think the ne next question is about earlier time. Was the basic early driver warfare or was it the struggle for survival in a harsh environment, which is also a form of competition between groups? Exactly. So here I am basically with uh, Pete um, and you and other people. I think that uh, the primary driver was um, uh, as you say in your models, it's uh, us competing against the uh, environment, not us versus them. For the reasons that probably there were some periods during the Pleistocene when uh, climate was uh, good enough for populations to build up, but probably then they, we do see evidence of warfare. But my guess is that um, it was less important. It was really those groups who can could keep uh, the memory, the uh, old people who had uh, you know, the knowledge to transmit to the next generation. Those are the groups who probably won in competition against the harsh environment. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Um, uh, the next one is, what's your view on the work of David Vengro and David Graeber on social complexity? Ah, well, uh, that's a loaded question. I have uh, written a, a blog post about this, which I'm, I was a bit harsh. Uh, on them, and of course, David Gravett unfortunately has passed away, so of the dead, no, nothing but good at this point. Um, so they are, the basic problem uh, with uh, them is that they are non-quantitative, and that allows them to make really ridiculous uh, statements. For example, they say monumental agriculture, monumental architecture was uh, present uh, in the Pleistocene, and they point to mammoth uh, huts. So um, I made a little bit fun of that uh, in my blog post. So I just refer you to, I have a blog post on peterturchin.com. So search for Wengro and you will, um, you will see my opinion. I think somebody already posted the link. Uh, in, 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 okay, in thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next one is um, with governance, uh, you start with all, uh, all the societies as points on an 11 dimensional hypercube. It's not obvious to me, but summing up the dimensions is the best way to collapse this into one dimension. Do the societies appear to fall on some small subset of the whole hypercube? Yes, this is a very good point. And in fact, this is one of the areas where I would be very happy uh, with people to expand our analytical approach. The data has been published. It's called Equinox 2020, and it has been uh, published in pretty finalized form in June of this year. Um, so um, you, um, uh, there is a link uh, to Sashat uh, um, Global History Data Bank, and I hope that somebody will uh, analyze it. But substantively, um, 
essentially, uh, they are correlated. Um, I have done, I looked at the, uh, how these binary uh, variables uh, change. Some of them depend on others. So for example, uh, you cannot have uh, 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 merit promotion before you have bureaucrats, all right? So, um, so, the, the, so basically, I feel um, that our scale is not bad, but it's not perfect. And I would be very keen for others uh, to apply analytic methods, methods to the same data. Thanks. Um, there is another technical question, I guess. Is linear regression enough to explain the complexity of evolution in multiple systems and multiple scales? No. Um, and so, as I say, we um, I test um, uh, in analysis for uh, nonlinearities. Turns out that uh, that uh, autoregressive term is often nonlinear, uh, and sometimes other terms. Uh, so I, I've I've done um, so far. I've used simple-minded approaches. I either use something like uh, second and third order polynomials, or maybe a box-cox transformation. I'm sure there are better uh, ways um, to do it. I know of better ways, and that's, again, I hope that others will approach it. But generally speaking, 90% of the time, uh, the linear regression uh, is the one which captures the data and is supported by AIC, by Akaiki. So that's where, um, that's where uh, we select the best model. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, have you thought of treating natural disasters like major volcanic eruptions uh, years without summer, etc., as natural experiments, I guess, to test. Yeah, the not I, but um, our, our collaborators, uh, Peter Peregrine and um, uh, Carol um, uh, um, uh, 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 Ember and others, uh, they have uh, uh, used this approach. And so I think this is a very valuable one. Um, and um, basically, uh, you can you could you, you could use such events. So Joe Manning, for example, uh, who, who is an Egyptologist uh, in, at Yale, and his colleagues, they looked at the effects of uh, major volcanic eruptions because they have global effect. So these are all great um, uh, approaches. Um, I pref I prefer not to focus on this on the one uh, historical um, you know experiment. I prefer to try to, to do as many uh, uh, of uh, different types as, as possible. But uh, this is a very valuable approach, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next one is interesting. Uh, it seems like the dynamics of cultural macroevolution macro are much different today compared to the period you've gathered data on. Uh, are you interested in prediction? And so uh, if you could elaborate a bit on the applicability of your conclusions to the modern world. And before you start, let me just tell people, uh, if I don't know, but Peter actually is the one who predicted social unrest in this country in this particular year, 12 years ago. Yeah, published uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, 10 years well, ago. Yeah, so um, things have been changing very dramatically. And so that's why um, we stop uh, at 1800 or so. Uh, because uh, we, have, we have plenty of work to do for pre-industrial period. But of course, uh, as a, a cultural evolutionist, I, um, it has not stopped. In fact, it has only uh, run now runs faster and the, um, uh, the different selection pressures um, are. It, one of the important selection pressures is, the, uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, on cultural traits that increase social resilience, the capacity of societies, of polities, to withstand internal and external shocks. So we have a big proposal, we call it crisis DB, where we are actually trying to, uh, to quantify social resilience and factors that either contribute to it or on the contrary, make a society more fragile. And uh, it's part of that uh, project is the one, uh, is the prediction I made 10, year, 10 years ago um, um, uh, for the United States. Uh, so, uh, work, uh, we, are, we are collecting uh, data and um, actually uh, we'll be running a bunch of models too on this uh, very interesting subject, uh, which is interesting because obviously it's one thing to study uh, collapsed societies in the past, you know, sitting uh, in front of a nice fire and drinking, you know, brandy or something, but it's the other thing to have a country collapsing around your ears. So um, uh, I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm quite uh, motivated uh, to see what we can possibly do. 
Okay. Yeah. The next one is uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, considering the complexity of your causal relationships of interest, how did you come up with the correct uh, model specification? And then in, in parentheses, I was surprised uh, to not see any interaction effect. Mm. Yeah, so uh, interaction effects, I have not delved into that yet uh, in, in, a, in a grand way. So this is something I, uh, I've done some um, uh, uh, preliminary analysis. I didn't see much and sort of, uh, I'm right now focusing on the first approximation, which is um, basically linear, uh, uh, linear combination of things. So that's another area for further research. But the way these um, uh, uh, models um, have been, um, uh, you know, um, the way we arrive at the best model is essentially I run all combinations, hundreds, sometimes thousands of uh, different predictors and sort them by uh, AIC. It's not uh, perfect, it's slightly liberal uh, because then uh, there's some, I don't know if people want me to go into statistical things. We basically have to use bootstrap to, uh, to get uh, more concern, more uh, proper um, uh, error, error um, you know, um, uh, the um, uh, confidence intervals and things like that. Um, but uh, essentially uh, the short uh, answer to this question is using the Akaiki, good, good old Akaiki to sort the models. Mm -hmm. And I usually look at the, uh, there is usually a few models within like Akaiki uh, of two or so from the best model. So I look at all of them to see uh, if we're missing anything. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, do you think the rise of a large scale governments uh, was inevitable? Is there something about human nature that causes humans of a certain size create qualities? Or is it more of open intellectual endeavor creation? Um, once the, um, the uh, Leicester uh, climatic chaos, as Pete and others have called it, uh, was over, so about 11,700 uh, years ago, uh, and um, climate has stabilized humans uh, have rapidly uh, spread and increased uh, uh, in most parts of the world. And so the human population started impinging on each other. There was always conflict uh, about, about resource use, which conflict leads to, uh, uh, you know, revenge and counter revenge uh, things. And so warfare was uh, inevitable. Warfare is inevitable, uh, not because humans are killer apes or anything, but because warfare is collective uh, violence. And so, uh, so basically uh, uh, humans, uh, in order for warfare to exist, humans have to cooperate. So it's the dark side of cooperation. And um, so, uh, so then the rise of uh, states was uh, inevitable in my view, because, and we see that uh, everywhere in the world. I mean, when uh, Cortes uh, and Pizarro arrived in, uh, the, uh, in the Americas, they saw states there, all right? Um, so, and the reason is that um, uh, big battalions win over small battalions. So in order to survive um, in a situation of, um, of such anarchic uh, 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 world, you have to scale up. If you want to scale up, you have to have governance because once you get beyond a couple hundred uh, thousand people, you uh, cannot rely on face-to-face uh, -face interactions uh, even, even before that. So, so in this respect, this was inevitable. However, uh, and, and here maybe it's a good time to uh, put a plug for my book, it's called Outer Society. Uh, in Outer Society, I also discuss how warfare is going to um, evolve itself out, so to speak. So if you're interested, uh, you might want to consult uh, that book. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you. There is a question that generated a lot of discussion here online, uh, but it would be interesting to know your thinking about this. Can evolutionary transitions happen in both ways? And what happens if we go backwards, not forward? Well, in, um, um, in human history, um, uh, I'm not sure about biological uh, transitions, but in human history, we are nowhere near the completion of this uh, uh, great uh, transformation. And so you saw in the data yourself that uh, polities go back and forth all the time. So the Roman Empire collapsed and became a bunch of little chiefdoms. Uh, you know, they lost uh, 
a lot of cultural uh, uh, baggage. So most people, uh, Roman, Roman, uh, Romans, many Romans in the Roman Empire were literate, uh, but the elites, uh, post-Roman elites were not literate. So there was a lot of cultural devolution and this happens um, many, many times um, across the world. So it's two steps forward, one step back all the time. Thanks. Uh, there are many questions about the warfare and in particular uh, when it originated, but I think you already said that kind of you think it's probably uh, relatively recent, like 10,000 years maybe. So I think- I'll Yeah, pervasive warfare, even less than 10,000 because it took some thousands of years for humans to spread or spread uh, mm -hmm. occupy uh, unused yeah, but There is another question uh, related to war kind of uh, from a different angle. Your data suggests that wars or preparation for them uh, look like a major engine of human social evolution. But the common sense is to avoid wars, even arms race by any means as a major, as a major destructive force of human uh, development. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm with you. I'm with this uh, person who asked this question. Wars are horrible, destructive and everything. But um, you cannot unilaterally uh, disarm if you do that. Uh, what happened in the evolutionary history of the last uh, few thousand years is those, those uh, polities that either uh, disarmed or were unable to compete, they got eliminated. And so, uh, so warfare became ubiquitous uh, uh, feature. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it's only once we have um, uh, um, some kind of a global governance, which is more effective than, than the United Nations. Even the United Nations actually has, has done um, not a bad job. Uh, Right, uh, so we just have to have better global governance uh, to uh, to stop wars. So that's what we should be working towards. Um, but uh, until you have that, uh, uh, somebody will, uh, some polity or another will always be tempted to defect from this cooperative equilibrium and start war. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, do your results uh, on the spread of large scale societies replicate in the Americas? Yes. No, so Americas did not have um, um, uh, either of the revolutions we talked about. There were more minor um, revolutions, um, uh, and uh, so this. But we see their effect uh, effects. Uh, so uh, both in the Andes, and uh, in Mesoamerica, and also uh, North America, like Cahokia. Uh, so uh, the trajectories they did not get as far. Um, but uh, the they were um, pretty much on the same uh, trajectory um, as uh, we see in the old world, so to speak. Thanks. Um, and there is an, an interesting question, um, and it's about a tendency for decreasing size of polities after 1940s, and Singapore and Norway are mentioned, and, and would how I guess how that would uh, connect to your to your theories. Yeah, so um, my thinking is that um, um, there is an optimum level of cooperation, which depends on what we are cooperating for. If we are not cooperating for mutual defense, then we don't need to have huge uh, states and empires. And so um, as a result of that, we see uh, devolution. So, um, you know, uh, I mentioned Czechoslovakia. Uh, already, uh, Soviet Union, of course, has uh, collapsed and uh, Yugoslavia has collapsed. And uh, some countries like Belgium is essentially a collapsed uh, state. Uh, they really should uh, just, uh, just divide up into whatever, two or three pieces and live uh, happily thereafter. So it's, um, uh, it's a natural thing because um, uh, economic level of integration, especially if you're part, if you're uh, if you are part of the world level, right, uh, economy, global economy, then uh, you don't need to have a large state. Small states are much more governable. Um, um, and so, uh, so uh, if we manage to stop wars, I expect that we'll have many uh, small states, smaller states. Mm -hmm. uh, there is kind of a technical question. How does the database take into account differences in governance within the same polities, for example, between metropolitan regions and frontiers? Hmm. No, we focus on the central uh, governance. We do have other, uh, some other variables that address regional variation, but uh, what I have uh, talked about, it's all the function of the central uh, government. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, 
There is a lot of questions, uh, but let me ask uh, the last one. We should, we should let you go, but all, all these questions, you'll be able to see them later. We'll, we'll have uh, the list of questions on the web page together with this video. Uh, if group selection is a form of multi-level selection, can we assign a dimension value to which it's related to the number of levels? Oh, I'm stumped. <laughs> dimension of value. Well, we do have a variable where we count the number of decision-making uh, levels. Uh, so, and that is actually, uh, that, that could be different in um, administrative, um, you know, a change of command versus say military chain of command or religion, uh, ideological chain of command. But uh, this is what I think about as a vertical dimension of uh, complexity, All right? I'm not sure I'm addressing the question though. Oh, that's okay. Well, I guess we should stop now. Uh, there, are, there are still a, a lot of questions, but we sh should let you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Peter, for the great talk and a great session. And we hope to see you next week when Ruf Mays uh, will be making a presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you uh, for having me. And uh, thank you all for listening.